Hey, it's number one best-selling author and motivational speaker, Eric Qualman. But most of you know me as Equal Man, and I'm excited about today's episode of Seven Super Tips. Remember, this is where we turn the tables and showcase other thought leaders that are out there that have either inspired me or I've shared the stage with and have gotten to know. And today's guest needs no introduction. It's the one and only Oprah Winfrey. Do you like being famous? Well, that is a good question, provocative question. I'll give you credit for that. Thank you. Um, however, <laughs> I'm not going to give you the answer that you want. And that is, you know, a yes or a no. Like, gee, I love being famous or no. Fame comes with the mission and purpose. You know, you cannot define me or try to put me in a box and you can't look at my life unless you look at the whole life. So I am a Negro, formerly, born in 1954 in Mississippi at a time when it was an apartheid state. And to be sitting here with you as your first guest in 2011 is a miracle that is beyond anything I could actually do for myself. So there's something greater at, at, at work here. And the thing that's greater at work, um, the force that has, and forces that have made this happen in my life, along with me working uh, as hard as I have, it's, it's, bigger than, it's bigger than I am. And fame is, is the vehicle from which I get to have this platform. So do I like that? I appreciate it. If I had been what I thought I was going to be, and that is a great fourth grade teacher, I would have also liked that. Because in, at the core of me, I am a teacher, and I am happiest when I feel that people are getting something, learning something, enhancing themselves in a way that they would never thought of before. That's really, truly one of my favorite moments on television or in any experience when I'm just one-on-one -on -one with a friend or somebody I don't even know, being able to share something with them and they think, I never thought of it, oh, gee. You have to know what sparks the light in you so that you, in your own way, can illuminate the world. So I wanted to take this time to talk about your early career and how you discovered your calling. So let's go back to when you were college age. Did you know that you wanted to get into TV and media specifically? No, I did not. I thought that I was going to be a teacher. Um, I was in my sophomore class at Tennessee State University. I'd already been working in radio since I was 16. And my, um, I remember I was in Mr. Cox's uh, drawing class for theater and I was a terrible drawer. He said I couldn't draw a straight line with a ruler. And, uh, and I got a call in that class from a guy at uh, the local station, CBS. And he'd been calling me several times when I was working in radio. Um, so I started working in radio at 16. I won the Miss Fire Prevention Contest, another long story. And uh, so when I went back to the station to pick up my prize, some guy said, would you like to hear your voice on tape? I said, sure. And I started reading this copy on tape. They called everybody in the building, said, here, this kid read. I was 16. They hired me in radio. So I was in radio at 16. And so I started getting calls about um, my freshman year to come into television. I had never thought about it. And still was living at home and couldn't figure out how I would manage those I had biology at one o'clock, and so I, I, I couldn't figure out how I would be able to manage my schedule. And Mr. Cox said to me, the one same, same professor said, you can't draw a straight line with a ruler. He said, I came back from, from uh, taking this phone call, and he said, who was that? I said, there's this guy at CBS, he keeps calling me, he wants me to interview for a job. And Mr. Cox said, that is why you go to school, fool. <laughs> So that CBS can call you. <laughs> that is why you're in school. So I, he said, you, you leave now and go call him back. And, and uh, 
I did, and I was hired in television, not knowing anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, having in mind Barbara Walters, but thinking, oh, okay, I can do that. Uh, not knowing how to write or film or anything. Mm. And I think it was because it was the, it was the times, and I literally had somebody who was willing to work with me that I, that I managed to, to find my way. But I had to find my way right. because the reporting never really fit me. And mm. what did work for me, I'm this old, I'm so old that when I started that um, it was a year of live action cam. <coughs> and so it was like video cameras live. And so the news stations would do a live, a live shot. They would throw to somebody live, even if nothing was going on, just so they right. could say live action cam. <laughs> And what I found is I wasn't so good at the writing part, mm -hmm. but if I was just standing up and talking about what had just happened, it was really good. Okay. And then I started to feel, so I started in 19, working in television, became an anchor immediately afterwards. My father still had an 11 o'clock curfew. Can you believe such a thing? <laughs> that I am, I am the 10 o'clock anchor. <laughs> In Nashville, Tennessee, I am the woman on the newscast reading the news. And my father would say, be home by 11. And I'd say, Dad, the news is on at 10. He goes, and it's off at 10.30, so be home by 11. <laughs> so I, I had a very strict, very strict father. So anyway, I, I could feel inside myself mm -hmm. that reporting was not the right thing for me, even though I was happy to have the job. Right. I got an offer to go to Atlanta. I was making $10,000 a year in 1971, but still in college, so I was thinking I was doing pretty good. Yeah. I got an offer to go to Atlanta for 40,000, which I thought, it's over. <laughs> I'm gonna make $40,000. And my boss at the time said to me, you do not know what you don't know, mm. and you need to stay here until you can learn to write better, until you, uh, can perfect your craft as, as a journalist. And so I, I, he said, and we can't give you 40, but we can give you 12. So, so I stayed, and you, you know, the reason why I stayed is because I could feel inside myself that even though the 40 was alluring at the time, that he was absolutely right. So to make a long story short, because I'd be here all day just talking about how it all came about, I started listening to what felt like the truth for me. Mm. A couple of years later, I moved to Baltimore. I could feel that as a reporter, and by this time, 22, I'm making 22,000. I met my best friend Gail there who said, oh my God, can you imagine if you're 30 and you're making 30,000? <laughs> and then you're 40 and then it's 40,000? <laughs> um, we actually had that conversation in the bathroom. So this is, I started to feel that reporting wasn't for me, but I had my father, I had my friends, everybody was saying, oh my God, you're, you're an anchor woman, you're on mm -hmm. TV, I mean, you can't give up that job. Okay. And when I was, by the time I was making 25, my father goes, well, you just hit the jackpot, you're not gonna make no more money than that, that's just it. <laughs> so I was torn between what the world was saying to me and what I felt to be the truth for myself. It felt like an unnatural act for me reporting, although I knew that to a lot of people it was glamorous. And I started to just inside myself think, what, what, what do I really wanna do, what I right. really wanna do? And I will say this, knowing what you don't want to do is the best possible place to be if you don't know what to do. Because knowing what you don't want to do leads you to figure out what is it you, you really okay. do wanna do. So you discovered talk then, right? around that time? I didn't discover talk, I was being, I got demoted. They oh. wanted to fire me, but I was, I was under contract for, and they didn't want to give up the 25,000. So right. they were trying to keep me on to the end of the year. So they put me on this talk, this is the way life works. They put me on a talk show to try to avoid having to pay me the contract out. And the moment I sat on the talk show, interviewing the Carvel ice cream man and his multiple flavors. <laughs> I knew that, that I had it. found home for myself. Because when I was a news reporter, it was so unnatural for me I, you know, to cover somebody's tragedies and difficulties and then to not to have feel anything for it. 
And I would go back after mm. a fire and I would take them blankets and then I would get a note from my boss saying, what the hell are you doing? Right. You're just supposed to report. Can't be that it. empathetic. You can't can't no. not be that empathetic. <laughs> and it felt unnatural for me. So um, if I were to put it in business terms it, it, or, or to leave you with a message, that the truth is I have from the very beginning listened to my instinct. All of my best decisions in life have come because I was attuned to what really felt like the next right move for me. And so it didn't feel right. I knew that I wouldn't be there forever. I never even learned the streets in Baltimore because I thought, I was there longer than I thought. I was there eight years. I should have learned the streets. <laughs> but I kept saying to myself, I'm not going to be here long. I'm not going to be here long. I'm not going to be here, so I'm not going to learn the streets. So when I got the call to come to Chicago, mm. after you know starting uh, with a with a co-anchor and and working an, in talk for several years, I knew that it was the right thing to do. And I knew that if I even if I didn't succeed, because at the time there was a there was a guy named Phil Donahue yeah. who was the king of mm. talk, and was on in Chicago. And every single person except my best friend Gail said you're going to fail. Every single person when I left, they, my bosses by this time thought I was terrific and said, you're gonna, you're, you're, you're walking into a landmine, you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail, Chicago's a racist city, you're black, you're not gonna make it. Everything to, to keep me sane. They then offered me a car and an apartment and all this stuff. And I said, no, if I fail, then I will find out what is the next thing for me, what is the next right. true thing for me. It felt right to you, so you went for it. Because it felt like this is now the move I need to make. And I was not one of those people, you know, all of my, um, the people who worked with me in news, they would have their tapes and they'd have their stories and they'd have, you know, uh, resumes ready. I didn't have any of that because I knew that the time would come mm -hmm. where I would, where what I needed would show up for me. Okay. And when that showed up, I was ready because my definition of luck is preparation meeting the moment of opportunity. that success is a process and I believe that my first Easter speech in the Kosciuszko Baptist Church at the age of three and a half was was the beginning and that every other speech every other book I read every other time I spoke in public was was a building block so that by the time I first sat down to audition in front of a television camera and somebody says read this what allowed me to read it so comfortably and be so at ease with myself at that time was the fact that I'd been doing it a while. If I'd never read a book or I'd never spoken in public before, I would have been traumatized by it. So um, the fact that um, we went on the air with the Oprah Winfrey Show in 1986 nationally and people say, oh, but you're, you're, God, you're so comfortable in front of the camera, you can be yourself. Well, it's because I've been being myself since I was 19. And I would, not have, I would not have been able to be as comfortable with myself had I not um, made mistakes on the air and been allowed to make mistakes on the air and understand that it doesn't matter. You didn't ask me that question. Oprah, what is it you do best? <clears throat> Oprah, what is it you do best? Yes. <laughs> the thing that, I, that I, I, I strive to do best is be here be now, right here, right now with you. The reason why we've had such a good time is because I'm not thinking about, somebody else is, but I'm not thinking about how much time do we have left and how many questions you're gonna have and what are you gonna ask me? Just be here, be now, so that I can enjoy this experience. And so um, I don't have a lot of, I don't live in the past, I don't carry the past into this moment because I do the Oprah show, I learned how not to do that. That's what all of those years of non-therapy, but paying attention to the guests on the show, the way they live their lives, what the experts had to say, what I've learned from paying attention. And this is what I know to be true. The reason why the show worked is because I understood that that audience, my viewers, the people who watched us every day and would come and just like you all did, uh, get tickets and they would come with their, you all just came across campus, but that's good too. 
<laughs> but people would come from all over the world just to be there with their aunts and their mothers, and they'd come with their cousins, and there'd be a few men in there going, what the hell? <laughs> or saying, well, I went to Oprah with you. I went to Oprah. <laughs> Oh, at least give me clear for three or four weeks. I went to Oprah with you. I had such regard for that. And I just had a conversation with John Mackey, who runs Whole Foods yeah. and has written this fabulous book. You should get it called um, Conscious Capitalism. Mm. And he was talking about how the investment in the stakeholders, the people who you are serving, that connection between the people who you're trying to serve and sell to, is equally as important as the people who you're buying from, right. equally as important as the people who are you know, supporting you financially, um, as your stockholders if you are you know, you know, a public company. So I always understood that there really was no difference between me and the audience. At times I might have had better shoes, but at the core, yeah, the okay. core of, of, of what really matters, that we are the same. Yeah. And you know how I know that? All of us are seeking the same thing. You're here at this fabulous school and we'll go out into the world and each pursue based upon what you believe your talents are, what your skills are, maybe your gifts are, but you're seeking the same thing. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's what you're looking for, the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. And because I understand that, I understand that if you're working in a bakery and that's where you want to be, and that may be, the, that may be what you've always wanted to do is to bake mm -hmm. pies for people or bake cakes for people or to offer your gift, then, then that's, that's for you. And there's no difference between you and me, except that's, how, that's your platform, mm -hmm. that's your show every day. So my understanding of that has allowed me to reach you know, everyone. To, to, to reach everyone. And, and there's no way that you wouldn't because that's, that's what I truly feel. So often we spend our lives wishing and hoping and hoping and wishing and desiring things. This is what I know for sure. You don't get what you wish for. You don't even get what you hope for. You get what you believe. So what is it you believe and know to be God's dream for you. So I live in the dream. I'm living in the space of the dream. And dream's good, dream's good. The dream is greater than anything that I could have imagined. You know, when I was a little girl, my father, on Sunday mornings after church, he was a deacon, so he thought he had to say goodbye to every single person. We were the last car leaving the parking lot in the green Oldsmobile. And we would drive through the white people's neighborhoods. And I used to dream the dream, driving through the white people's neighborhoods. We'd drive through the white people's neighborhoods and you'd see their fancy houses. Some of them had gates, but all of them had trees. And I remember when I first came to Baltimore, I met a friend. Hello, Baltimore in the house. When I first came to Baltimore, I, I, I made friends with a wonderful woman named Arlene Weiner. She was the wealthiest person I'd ever met. And I went to her house and parked in the driveway. There was a Corvette and there was a BMW and there was a Mercedes. I went, whoa, Arlene's rich. And at Arlene's house, once I got inside, I could see from her kitchen window six trees in the front yard. I thought, oh, rich people have trees. When I get rich, I'm going to get me some trees. I'm not just going to get me. Everybody want to get cars and pocketbooks and shoes, but I want me some trees. So as life would have it, I was standing in my kitchen window about three years ago in California, making coffee in the morning, and I was looking out the window, and I saw the six trees. But listen to me. I was making, making, making the coffee. I saw the six trees. I went out on the porch to actually count the six trees. And this is what I noticed, that I could dream the six, but beyond the six trees, 
in my kitchen window are 3,687 trees. How do I know? Because I had them counted. I had them counted. So I said, I want to know how many trees out there. I dreamed the six. That's as much as my, 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 my small mind and my imagination could hold for myself. I dreamed the six, but God can see beyond the six. Can see beyond the six because there was a bigger dream for me. And I'm here to tell you there is a bigger dream for you, Essence. There's a bigger dream. And so the key, the secret, the magic is to surrender to God's dream for you. To quit fighting against and pushing against and disallowing against and resisting against and trying to tell the creator, the universal forces, divine intelligence, what you are supposed to do and get still and know for sure what his dream, the dream, is for you. I say to the, my girls all of the time that your real work is to figure out where your power base is and to work on the alignment of your personality, your gifts that you have to give, with the real reason why you're here. That's, that's the number one thing you have to do, is to work on yourself and to fill yourself up and keep your cup full, keep yourself full. Now, I used to be afraid of that. I used to be afraid, particularly from people who say, oh, she's, she's so full of herself, mm, she's so full of herself. And now I embrace it. I, I consider it a compliment that I am full of myself. Because yeah. you only when you're full, I'm full, I'm overflowing, my cup runneth over. I have so much, I have so much to offer and so much to give. And I am not afraid of honoring myself. You know, it's miraculous when you think about it. First of all, for me, my father and mother never married. They had sex one time underneath an oak tree because she was wearing a poodle skirt in 1953. <laughs> and my dad, to this day, says, I want to know what's under that skirt. That's what I want to know. <laughs> he wanted to know what was under the skirt. They didn't really have a relationship. She wanted one, but, you know, he went under the skirt and then that was it. And one time under the oak tree, bam. Renaissance. Woman is born. <laughs> it happened there. That's why I know my life is bigger than that. My life has to be bigger, as yours is, bigger than a, moment, than a poodle skirt. It's much bigger. The design, the, the, the reason why I'm here is much bigger than, oh, I think I want to see what's under that. So the ability to, 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 to take care of that, to honor that, to honor yourself and that which is greater than yourself that which cre was the reason for your being here. That, 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 there's no selflessness in that because only through that do you have the ability to offer yourself, your whole self, your full expression of who you are to the rest of the world. Thank you for joining us for today's Seven Super Tips episode with the one and only Oprah Winfrey, who reminds us to be present on a day-to-day -day level. Hopefully it helps you unlock and unleash your inner superpower. So keep watching, and in the meantime, remember, it's not what we take from this world, it's what we leave behind. In the moment. Is it raining? Yeah, it's out. And hopefully you're watching on a day-to-day -day level. All right, it's about to rain. I gotta get this out. Okay. Hey, it's Eric. Hey, it's Eric Qualman. Wait, sorry. <clears throat> and I've been blessed to be able to travel to 47 countries and motivate people. And motivate 25 million people. Okay. <laughs>